Um, to chapter 13. So chapter 11, chapter 12, these are um, the assessment chapters, and they're basically setting you up for how to begin the development of your integrated training programs, meaning integrated, meaning a lot of different variables, okay? And, and really, how do we identify the OPT model as our first sense of exercise program? Because each subsequent chapter after this goes directly from one step of the programming to another, to another, to another. All right, so it, it, this is a, now that we've gotten to this point, the assessments build upon the modalities that we're gonna talk about, and then those modalities get broken down into specifics within the flexibility realm, balance, speed, agility, quickness, plyometrics, uh, cardio, respiratory, and then resistance training. So we have to worry about these five phases amongst other things. So again, working with this OPT model and the integrated training is very important because we have to be able to understand and through a lot of research that uh, I've done in particular because I did, this is actually the chapter that I wrote, um, one of the chapters I wrote for the textbook is that this chapter 13 is more about how we go about, you know, implementing multiple aspects into that program and making it so it's not just one dimensional where all we do is lift weights and then go home. Okay, and that's really the bottom line here because the research has shown that it's very, very important. All right, so again, integrated training, the, the main component to that is, like it says here, it's a concept that applies to um, all forms of exercise, like we just said, flexibility, cardio, core, balance, plyo, SAQ, and then resistance training, and we put and merge that all into one. So, you know, the main focus here is that, you know, there are some psychological benefits that come with it, obviously physiological benefits. We get some body comp changes that can come depending upon your goal. And then obviously there is a performance benefit where you can actually move better through those developments of flexibility increase, endurance, strength, and power increases as well. So what do we have to be aware of is that we have to be able to provide what we call progressive overload. Now, progressive overload is a really important aspect because we can't just say, okay, you're going to start here and then you stay there for four months and then you go to something new. It has to be, okay, this is challenging them, not as bad as we thought they were, so we're going to take that and, and ramp that up. Whereas this one here, this parameter here, might not have caught up as much and we're going to take our time going through that. So progressive overload is in those moments, what you know, actually increasing the intensity and or volume of everything in, inside of the exercise program and basically growing it in the correct order to constantly give positive results, all right? So everybody's progressive overload is gonna be different and that's gonna make a huge difference when it comes to you know, creating individualized exercise plans. So there are some, you know, the, the skip in the skip steps versus the progressive and, and being systematic about everything. Yeah, I mean, increased risk of injury, client frustration, not meeting goals or lacking or delaying those goals you know, lack of measurement and tracking. The worst thing I have seen inside of facilities, and I really hope that everybody who watches this video understands, is that you have to be able to document. You have to be able to track from where they started and move them through a specific training program. And without being able to do that, you don't know which direction to go in. You can't just make up a workout on the fly and expect that to be some sort of amazing miracle that's gonna happen. So you have to make sure that you have this ability to track. And then also there's just an inconsistency within that programming and then that just leads to a disaster in its own mind. All right. So the main thing we want to focus on here are those five things on the bottom. When we're talking about, you know, specific aspects of our movement patterns, we want to make sure that we're hitting on those, those aspects of squatting, hip hinging, pulling motions, pushing motions, and vertical pressing. All of those motions will give us different planes of motion to work in. They're very dynamic in nature and they can always be manipulated and modified. So all of these movement patterns will help, but th those are the main aspects of everything. Squatting is anything from sitting down and trying to, you know, sit in a chair up and down. So the elderly population can work on that with a little bit of added weight. You know, that's just a simplistic way of putting it. Hip hinging, bending down and getting something off the floor, you know, pulling motions, you know, that, that could be anything from 
um, re you know, reaching into the dryer and pulling out a stack of clothes. That's a pulling motion, pushing motions, moving a box across the floor, and then vertical pressing. That could even be as simple as taking a, for some people, it could be aggressive where you take a, a water bottle, meaning like a, a gallon water container, and lifting it up overhead to push, put it on the top shelf. So these are all things, you know, that's how, that's how you're taking your activities of daily living and transitioning them from the movement patterns that we try to establish in, in our integrated training and progressive overload. So obviously the aim here is for training with posture that is correct. So if we've assessed that that person statically, you know, again, I, and I say statically, but in it without movement in terms of moving feet forward and backward, but doing the press, the pushing, the pulling, the overhead squat and single leg squat assessments, we can determine where their optimal posture, you know, if they have optimal posture for specific movements. So we, you know, with optimal posture, with optimal form, which we could also say we reduce injury risk, we maintain health of that person, and we make things more enjoyable because you're not compromising them and making them feel uncomfortable in, a, in, in something that is supposed to well, not necessarily be comfortable, but the exercise is supposed to be challenging without feeling some sort of way. All right, so the more enjoyable you make it. So again, what do we wanna make sure of? Proper flexibility, proper, proper strengthening. So getting rid of that overactive, underactive premise within muscles. We also wanna work with unilateral bilateral, meaning side to side, one at a time, or double bilateral together at one time, exercises along with front and back, anterior, posterior. We want symmetry from right and left and front and back sides of the body. We want, we want to diminish any sort of imbalances that we might have. Now, we could also even say with that, because unilateral is the way it is, we could talk about diagonal patterns as well, you know, left to right, right to left in terms of like the left front, the left anterior, right posterior, the right anterior, left posterior. All of those things make a huge difference. So then what do we do? Make sure our flexibility, our core, balance, plyo, and resistance training exercises are all used with optimal posture, uh, optimal form to be able to improve posture as well. So one can carry over to the other. Also making sure that we go through full range of motion. There is nothing more challenging than doing a full range of motion pull-up. But when you're, you know, now uh, you go to the gym and you see somebody that's trying to do a pull-up and they come down halfway and they come back up, all they're doing, and we talked about it before, is all they're doing is working within that mechanical advantage that we talked about in the in the previous chapter about you know how the human movement system works all right i believe that's chapter six so with that we have to understand that you know you're not getting the most benefit if you're cutting your range of motion in half in a by a quarter by three quarters you're, you're only strengthening that one area but you're you're diminishing the effect of the whole range of motion so Again, the degree to which a specific joint can move. So we have to be aware that if we constrain something or if we avoid going any further, then you know we're, we're not optimizing. So we have to be aware of that. Now, the only problem that we, the, the one major problem that we have to work with though is that you know inside of those optimal ranges of motion, we have to be paying attention to what that person's doing because not everybody's range of motion is the same. So we have to adapt it for them. Is there a previous injury? Is there some other aspect that comes from that? So we have to always be on alert of that as well. So, you know, again, with all planes of motion, that's very similar to optimal range of motion because with optimal range of motion, we can go through frontal, sagittal frontal and transverse plane motions. Now, remember from that same chapter of the human movement system, sagittal is forward and backward motions of the limbs. Frontal is side to side and transverse is that rotational. So we're using all planes of motion to create the best muscle recruitment patterns so that we can move in a variety of ways. And that's only going to help us, you know, with all planes of motion in full range of motion to create the best movers we can. So with that, how do we do it? Well, we have to provide acute variables that make sense. Okay, that's the bottom line. Acute variables have to make sense here. Now, acute variables are those components of a, of a training session that you will manipulate and they will also be um, appropriate for the goal of a person and also appropriate for what their assessments shown. All right, so we're talking about things like repetitions, sets, 
Okay, we know what reps and sets are. Repetitions and sets. One movement of an exercise, a group of movement, a, a group of reps, reps sets. Training intensity. Now, training intensity could also be labeled as weight. It could be labeled as um, effort, particularly. So any additional effort that you're putting on. So it doesn't have to be a weight plate or a dumbbell. It could be a weighted vest or whatever it may be. Um, the repetition tempo. Sometimes we can label tempo with speed. Okay, speed and tempo kind of go hand in hand in this aspect. There's rest intervals, which have to be dictated by what you're trying to do. The, the more max strength and power you go, the longer the rest time. The more stabilization and muscular endurance that you provide in terms of the, the OPT model and what phase you're in, that will have less of a rest period and more volume, which we'll talk about in a second. And then in the middle there with hypertrophy, you know, we're talking more about that uh, moderate range of reps, sets, and rest. So training volume truly is the number of, the, it's the sum of the repetitions performed multiplied by the sets that you have. So if you did, let's just go through that example there. If you did five sets of six, okay, that equals 30. But if you did five sets of six at 100 pounds, then that's going to equal 300. Um, that's too many zeros. There we go. That's 300. All right. So therefore, when you know you can have what we call a, a training volume or a rep sets volume, or you can have what we call a true training, a weighted training volume, which includes the the amount of weight that you do. So either way is correct. So if you're trying to see how much overall weight you're lifting in that, that's your overall volume. Whereas this is more of your, your train, your exercise volume, which is more of like your, your reps times your sets. So training frequency, how many days per week? We can always modify that. Training duration, how long each session is inside of that frequency, how, how long you're training in that one session. Um, exercise selection, what mode or what type, what type of exercise are you doing for what body part? And then lastly, exercise order. Now, typically with order, we always think about making, depending upon your goal, but really the mainstay is do all of your compound or multi-joint or multi-muscle movements first before you would go to your isolated movements. And that's really the main function there, okay? So we've kind of hit on this before, but doing your assessments first makes a lot of sense. It makes it so that we have this, this again, I, I've said this word a lot over the course of a few of the chapters, but getting baseline starting points will help you to number one, function in the right manner because like it says here, if you detect imbalances, abnormal, abnormalities, or any health concerns, and we get those out of the way first, we can, we can then program everything correctly after that. Or should I say, if you have a baseline and it has imbalances, abnormalities, and health concerns, that's your baseline. And it's, it's, it's more of a poor health Re regimen at that point. So therefore our baseline is very low and all we can do from there is corrective exercise and positive, um, positive training through all integrated functions at that point. All right. So assessment results are very, very important. So we know where to start. We develop that baseline and we know where to start. Okay. So the first thing we talk about within the integrated training concepts are what we, the flexibility training. So flexibility training, we're not going to dive into this wholeheartedly today, but we'll understand that this is going to be a built upon chapter. And I believe it's chapter 16 that will be completely about flexibility. All right. So flexibility training, working within that full range of motion, um, you know, again, increased joint range of motion, possible decrease in muscle soreness if we're helping to stretch when we're supposed to. All right, and then potential for reduction in injuries, all right? So anything from foam rolling to static stretching, active stretching where it's more of a movement and then hold at the end range for a couple of seconds and then do it again. And then dynamic stretching are what NASM really dives into pretty deeply. But we're talking about just improving that extensibility of our tissues so that we can move better and feel better. Cardio or cardiorespiratory training, we're talking about, you know, respiratory and cardiovascular functioning becoming higher, right? Trying to obtain or basically obtain, but uptake the most amount of oxygen that we can at that time so that we can make us better movers longer, okay? Endurance-based. So walking, jogging, running, cycling, biking, swimming, rowing, and sport 
of that kind are what we're going to be focused on here. And here's a lot of the benefits. Resting heart rate and blood pressure will go down. Increased stroke volume and cardiac, cardiac output. Improved gas exchange. There's less resistance within the airways. There's an improved oxygen uptake, which we just talked about. There's less resistance in blood flow, and there's more blood volume, so you can supply nutrients and O2 as needed. There's improved, uh, improved blood lipid profiles, meaning cholesterol goes down, triglyceride numbers go down, HDLs go up, LDLs go down. All right, all of those, you know, and then of course, do you have more red blood cells? Do you have more white blood cells? Do you have the right amount of proteins? And you know, all of those things make a huge difference. And then lastly, you know, you have that blood flow back to the heart via the veins, meaning that your veins can function better and can supply the blood back to the heart quicker and with more volume to keep everything flowing correctly. Then moving into our core training, now we're talking about basically posture and spinal health. That's the main thing here. But again, it, we're trying to be, you know, with core, we, we talk about a lot of the terminology for that is core stability. And that's basically making sure that the trunk, all right, with the pelvis and the legs are controlled optimally, making sure that the shoulder girdle mixed with the arms are controlled properly so we can transfer force better, okay? We're basically trying to get the, the core musculature, which to be very, you know, very non-specific, which we'll get more into core training, I believe in chapter 17. Um, I believe it's chapter 17. Um, no, chapter 16, I think uh, flexibility might be 15. So either way, core training, we're talking about basically the hip from above the knee. So anything that connects to the hip and anything above the knee and all the way from up to the sternum, that's really front and back and lateral side and medial sides. All those muscles that connect in those regions are your true core. It's not just your abs. So we wanna get rid of that myth and misconception right now. So really, again, what's the benefit? Again, posture and, and spinal health. Um, you can function better for all of your activities of daily living. Walking up and down stairs won't be so much of a challenge if your core is healthy, surprisingly enough. If you're on the job, meaning like, even if you're, if you're a police officer, a firefighter, a garbage worker, you know, that collects garbage, like all, all those individuals have, you know, different movements that they do throughout the day. And by, by having a strong core it can help them stay stable so they don't have so much injury potential. Okay. Um, so also increased balance, stabilization and coordination of our chain, of our kinetic chain. You know, we can minimize low back pain. We can improve our skill-related movements, things like uh, empower. So skill-related movements, more athletic-based things like a tennis racket, a golf club, um, playing basketball, you know, being able to be agile, balanced, coordinated, and core, the core stability of that helps everything, helps everything. Balance training, again, ability to, main, you know, to um, maintain your balance over a base of support and without falling, like it says here. And that's really, again, postural control. No, you know, having a good sense of your center of gravity, having a good base of support so you can stay within that center of gravity so you don't fall. So at that point there, yeah, there we go. Reduce risks of fall. We can reduce ankle sprains. We can improve our landing. Like if you're working on jump training, you can improve lower extremity strength. Okay, proprioception and body, knowing where your body is in space and body awareness, all right? And then there's the agility again, agility-based outcomes in athletes. The more balanced you are, the more you're able to change direction very handedly. You have stronger hip musculature, all right? And, you all, and also of the lower extremities. So balance training provides this optimal position and place for where you're supposed to be. Plyometric training. Okay, plyo is, you know, it can be labeled as reactive training or jump training, but don't just assume that a box jump is a plyometric activity. So we'll get more into that later on in the specific plyo chapter, but know that that's part of the exercise plan, all right? So again, plyometric training has a lot to do with power, so being able to move higher loads faster. So even if it's just your body weight, being able to propel your body faster, all right? Now, it doesn't require a lot of volume because you're working very, very hard in what we call that stretch shortening cycle. So we've talked a little bit about that in the muscular chapter, but working on pulling that rubber band really tight and then letting it go very quickly. That's the true definition of that reactive plyometric base. So again, with this, because there's a lot of force involved, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, and because it's what we consider weight bearing, bone mineral density, 
and, and diminish risks, you know, increase bone mineral density, decrease risks of any joint or bone injuries. Again, uh, positive for that, improve soft tissue strength, and that can decrease injury. Metabolic expenditure, when you're doing plyometric bases, your heart rate can get up pretty quick, you know, and that can also help with a little bit of body composition changing and weight loss. Strength and power for athletes and the general population, doesn't really matter, it's anybody. Muscle contraction and nervous system synchronizing or functioning better but with, you know, very quickly and, and it's able to, you know, basically sync up to the, to the point where you don't have uncoordinated movements. And then improve performance if you're going to be, even if it's, it doesn't have to be just an athlete, it could be a recreational sport, it could be on a Sunday playing volleyball at the beach, it doesn't matter. All of this will help. Speed, agility, and quickness sounds the similar to plyometrics, but it's not. Here we're working on um, motor skills, all right? So being able to, you know, have fundamental motor skills and increase the capacity of those. So even if it's like something like fast, quick hops or fast, quick skips, all of those things make a huge difference when it comes to, you know, better precision, better game time functioning, better movement, again, because anybody can work within this, all right? So that's one of the main factors there. So we're also helping with fall prevention. We're helping with, again, we said agility, reaction time. We're talking about sprinting velocity can all help with this and then lower body power. So it does kind of have a trade-off between power, plyometric, speed, agility, and quickness training. They all kind of inter interrelate. All right. So yeah, top speed, change of direction, rate of acceleration and deceleration. All right. Improve physical, you know, health related physical fitness, even though you're working skill related, it helps you feel better and, and kind of have that natural day to day, you know, feel of that. Um, Enhance response time to a stimulus or a better reaction time. Perfect. That's what we're all about is that speed and quickness and, and acceleration reaction time. And then improve you know, technical skills of things like sprinting, which is straight linear speed versus change of directions, which is more agility and quickness. So being able to start and stop, turn on a dime, everything like that. So resistance training, that's this is the end marker of the last part of our res, of our true exercise programming model. So we started at flexibility and we've progressed all the things that we just talked about from flexibility to this resistance training would make up a one training session model. All right. So again, strength, hypertrophy, bone density, cardiovascular health, muscular endurance, all these things, body composition changes, all this can make a huge difference if we use resistance training correctly. All right. So again, endurance, strength, power, muscular hypertrophy, weight management, Resting metabolic rate, resting heart rate, blood pressure. So then there's your cardiovascular. Improve coordination and athleticism through higher levels of strength and endurance and power. And then decrease risk of injury to ligaments, tendons, cartilage, and muscle fibers. So very, very important for this aspect. Resistance training is not just to get stronger. There's way more to it, and we'll dive way more into that in its own specific chapter. So what are we looking at in, in terms of, so we started, if we go back up, started at our flex, our, so our integrated training consists of, there's the first one, flexibility. It's, it doesn't have its own label, but it's there. And then we progress from flexibility. We would then add in a little bit of cardio into our training session, or this could be part of your warm up, or it could be a dedicated day. Core training would be in your daily workout, balance training in your daily workout, plyometric in your daily workout speed, agility, and quickness in your daily workout, and then resistance training is in your daily workout. You can manipulate any of those variables on any given day for any given person, and that's what makes it very, very dynamic, and it can be always used in the right manner. So that's what the OPT model is all about, is giving you the right level to train at, stabilization, strength, and power. If you look at this here, look at the stabilization, strength, and power. All three of those are the levels with five distinct phases. Phase one works with stabilization, phase two, three, and four with strength, and phase five with power. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive right into that and, and kind of focus on those parts. But stabilization, the first introductory phase. This is the one where if you haven't worked out before, this is the one you're going to start in. Okay. What's your improvements for this? Well, the focus is on movement patterns, getting better at them, exercise technique, changing muscular imbalances, getting your range of motion back, getting your flexibility back improving your stabilization of your core and the peripheral joints so your limbs preventing injury to any sort of you know 
tissue overload. So anywhere thing from muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints themselves that will impose demands. Okay. Um, and then obviously with that, improving our overall cardiorespiratory conditioning, right? All of those are part of that stabilization. It's the first phase. Anybody can be in this, but this is where the new beginners would go to. But anybody can drop down into the stabilization when we want to get like a, a, a refresher for our body or a quick fix. So, there, you know, what's the goal? Optimal movement patterns. There's specific exercises that we'll go into during this section that will open this up a little bit more. But again, they're more about slow and controlled movements with lighter loads. Um, and then proper posture and exercise technique are going to be there. Strength, on the other hand, has those two, you know, phases two, three, and four. Phase two being strength endurance, phase three being muscular development training, more about hypertrophy, and then phase four being maximal strength training. Goal here is to obviously provide specific stimuli for our muscles, okay? Um, that's going to be the main goal is to be able to provide that correct stimulus. So, you know, what's our goal for strength is, again, for strength endurance is to, you know, increase our endurance capability, but also improve our prime, our main muscle prime mover strength. So how we do that is through supersets. This is a very key term that we want to pay attention to. Supersets are a back-to-back -back exercise. So you complete one exercise followed by another. And a, what you would do is a strength-based movement followed by a stabilization-based movement. Now, the weight, again, is not going to be very relatively high, but it's going to be challenging, and you're going to follow it up with a very similar exercise thereafter. So a bench press by, followed by a push-up is going to be pretty tough of a, of a one-two combination punch, okay? And again, we're just trying to create endurance by doing that, so we can't build too heavy of a weight for that. Phase three, on the other hand, is that muscular development, so hypertrophy. Okay, it's going to be its own entity. An example would be someone who's like a bodybuilder trying and right here, like we said, the goal, if you were in phase two is to increase volume and intensity of the particular exercises to get us to that point of more muscular development. All right, as opposed to maximal strength, which again is going to use lighter volume, but higher intensity, higher weight. Okay, heavy loads lifted, not a lot, but enough to provide a really aggressive stimuli. So power lifters, strength athletes, like, like I said, an American football lineman, that would be somebody. And then, of course, we could talk about Olympic weightlifters and, and the like. All right. But again, this is an advanced strategy. Not everybody wants to be in the maximal strength training, but everybody can so rightfully deserve to be there and, and work within that phase. And then lastly, power, power training. What's the goal? Increase maximal strength and rate of force production. So therefore, we're trying to move whatever we can, as strong as we can, as fast as we can. And that's exactly what we want to do here. Now, the, again, power training is a superset base with a strength focused movement followed by a very explosive movement. So uh, we'll come down off of the chest because we did it the first time, but a dumbbell overhead shoulder press followed by front medicine ball oblique throws, which were based oblique throws. We're working on, you know, front down into the front, catch it come up over the top of the head with the with the ball come down slam it to the other side those can be one you know those are again very aggressive motions that we're going to work with so each one of these phases you know that we want to work within we're going to break this down more and more as we move forward with our chapters so this is just one focus just to say okay here's your opt model this is how we take an integrated training model and put those five phases of the three stages, stabilization, strength, and power. And remember, they get those three get broken up into five. Stabilization, mus uh, strength, endurance, um, muscular development, maximal strength, power. And all those will be very critical for us to make sure we develop the right person with the right entities. All right. So again, chapter 13 is not a lot of information, but it is key to making sure we know how to program correctly and have all those from flexibility to resistance training and everything in between on these slides and then making sure we put them into the right mold or the right OPT model mold. All right. So again, like I said, not very aggressive with a lot of information, but this is really important information to take and carry with us throughout. So again, we're going to keep carrying on here. 
Uh, chapter 14 will break things down a little bit more, and I believe chapter 14 might be flexibility. So we'll, we'll continue on with that and make sure that as we go through, yeah, chapter 14 will be flexibility, and then chapter 15 thereafter, we're just going to keep going. Flexibility, then right into cardio, then we'll go into some, ba- um, some core, then balance, and we'll keep progressing down the line. So thanks for your time on everything. I hope everybody takes all this and really starts soaking it up because now is the time where we're going to get into the main crux of why we want to become a trainer. So have a great day and we'll hear from you soon.